Welcome back, Libro Maniacs. Welcome to the most popular show on YouTube. It is getting crowded in the comment section, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you might have to just bookmark this page and uh, watch it later when uh, when it won't crash the server. How you doing today? Today we're going to be talking about Lucy. Um, specifically, I guess technically, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, right? Because that song's after Lucy the skeleton found in Africa. The famous skeleton. Is it the earliest? Is it? I, I know it's like... At one time, it was considered the earliest human. I don't think that's the case anymore. But maybe it is. I can't. I can't even remember. I learned that so long ago, Lucy. That was decades ago. Anyways, so uh, was Lucy an aquatic ape? That is the question. So. One of the, the, the best, my favorite of all time books, science books, is The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis by Elaine Morgan. Um, I'd never really read this until not too long ago, anyways. Um, I read it, I, I knew a little bit about it peripherally from another book on uh, cryptozoology. It was like proposing the idea of oh, maybe the aquatic ape theory is right, and maybe one of them stayed in the water, and that's what mermaid sightings are. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. And it had a little brief outline about some of the main points of the aquatic ape theory, and you're like, oh, yeah, that kind of adds up. One of them was uh, the hair, the body hair line is all, like, streamlined for aquaticness, I guess. But uh, this book, though, um, trust me, I don't, you're going to read nonsense about it online, which is typically the case. They can make anything sound stupid and anything stupid sound cool. But this is, uh, something that they're making sound stupid, which is one of the best theories of all time. Um, this is, this is how science is politicized. This is a, a lesson in how science is politicized. Um, the lady who wrote this, she was writing, uh, she was a feminist. I don't know what wave feminist, but she was riding one of the waves of feminism back in the day. And so this was considered feminist scholarship. And so it was just poo pooed. But uh, she didn't, Elaine Morgan did not pioneer this theory. I guess it goes back to um, some marine biologist. Uh, what's his name? I want to say he's Russian. Uh, you can look it up. Um, but anyways, uh, there was a guy that came up with this theory, and uh, his name, his name, like it's Alistair something, Alistair Hardy, maybe, um, Alistair, maybe that weird English spelling, but anyways, it was a marine biolog biologist, I want to say it's Alistair Hardy, and uh, he came up with this theory, it kind of just went out there, and nobody, uh, you know, Nobody refuted it, but nobody really endorsed it either. It was just kind of like taboo or something. And uh, Elaine Morgan resurrected it and added to it or just put more evidence forth for it. And uh, this book, I tell you what, it's it's such a slam dunk. Um, it literally, the one of the criticisms of the aquatic ape theory is, is it's an umbrella theory. Everything fits. It's no, it's like, no, everything fits because it's, it's obvious, you know, like there's, there's this ton of information or ton of, uh, like the marine biologist, Alistair Hardy was saying, Hey, look, you know, like, um, we have breasts, humans have breasts, uh, our closest relatives do not, and they get by a fine without having them. So why do we have them? And he notes, oh yeah, our breasts are kind of like I think it's manatees. Um, so he's like, oh look, it's like a, it's like another aquatic animal. 
And then there's this body fat issue of why do we have so much body fat? Why do we have so much insulation? Like our metabolism is half that. The reason why we live so long is because our metabolism is half that of a normal animal. I don't know. I recently, uh, uh, in the last, like I, I got my first dog. I'm on my first dog. And, uh, um, you notice right away, like, wow, these things are little balls of energy. They're so warm. Like, like they can, they can overheat you easily. Like if you're taking a nap and they snuggle up next to you, you can be like, whoa, like I'm so hot now. It's like a electric blanket turned on like super high. Um, our metabolisms are so, uh, low compared to other animals because we have all this insulation well what do we have this insulation for what do we have all this fat for normal animals don't like our closest relatives do not have remotely as much fat as we do and i mean people that are fit even like not not saying you know right now we're in like this obesity epidemic but that's not how we have this body fat like we naturally have a lot more body fat than our closest relatives why um and uh, we have an affinity to water, like we're the only primate that like likes enjoys swimming. Uh, all of our religions are based around it. Like whether you want to go to the Hindu Sarasvati civilization in India or India and Pakistan, if you want to go to uh, the Mesopotamian culture in in between the rivers of the uh, Euphrates and the Tigris, uh, you can go to Egypt. All the ancient civilizations are built upon rivers. And they were people that treated these rivers as holy and they they did ritual you know baptisms in them like christianity still has that tradition um it's also a tradition in judaism it's just not like as prominent as it is in christianity but hinduism bathing in the uh, in the ganges is a religious tradition um and it's it's needed for agriculture like you need rivers to irrigate land uh for water so the aquatic cave theory is like a slam dunk in all these ways both biologically uh it's just this extra step in human evolution it's like oh we we went into the water like a kind of and there's other animals that have done this it turns out like there used to be this uh uh animal classification of pachyderm and uh it was like rhinoceroses and elephants and hippopotamuses and all these things that uh that are hairless animals well it turns out that they aren't technically a group but they're all either were aquatic or are aquatic like a hippo is currently semi-aquatic whereas rhinoceroses and elephants were formally but they still have the hairlessness hairlessness from the time that they were so it's like it's like it's like the opposite of a dolphin you know like a dolphin is a mammal that went into the water well there's water there's there's like an elephant is a semi-aquatic animal that went fully land now they're not well i mean they can go in water and they do go in water but they're not semi-aquatic like a like hippopotamuses anyways this theory is such a slam dunk but because it was a feminist who proposed it and it and it kind of upset the whole masculine uh everything was from the savannah like all of our key evolutionary points are from man the hunter in the savannah and and that kind of makes men feel awesome because we're like these super macho tarzans and that's why you know all the traits of human evolution well it explains it all differently it's like oh all these unique traits of human evolution aren't from us being this savage hunter in the in the wild it's actually from us being aquatic apes so people don't like it you know like that's we've already set science up with this uh we're this savage hunter and da 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 so the book starts out uh with a slam dunk um the whole book is a slam dunk uh but uh it talks about uh, where the hominids died. I'm going to read, uh, basically, if we have time, um, up to, I'm going to read page 22 and 23. Where the hominids died. In the Rift Valley, sites almost all, oh, I already messed it up. In the Rift Valley, sites almost all the hominid fossils that have ever been found from the oldest to the most recent, from Tanzania in the south to Ethiopia in the north, are the remains of creatures who died at, by the water's edge. There is, of course, nothing surprising about that. It is equally true of other mammals, simply because waterborne sediments provide the ideal conditions for fossilization. Terrestrial mammals like antelopes and baboons 
may have been living on the dry savanna, but no traces would remain of the ones that died there. Their bones would be scavenged by hyenas, trampled and dispersed by migrating herds, and any remaining fra fragments baked brittle by the sun and reduced to dust. Those of which we have records are the small minority whose bones happen to sink into the water or silt or mud and thus be preserved. This skew in the record is known as taphonomic bias, from the Greek word taphos, meaning tomb. It is one of the reasons why the savannah scenario was able to survive for so long, because one of the first lessons taught to fossil hunters is not to be fooled by the taphonomic bias. In attempting to reconstruct the lifestyle of an extinct animal, the water factor should be treated as irrelevant. Most of them lean over backwards to obey this injunction. One classic example of this can be found, or rather cannot be found, in Donald Johnson's, Johansson's book, Lucy. It was a popular book, packed with every fact about the discovery of the famous fossil, which he thought the general reader might find interesting. But he failed to mention a detail that at least one of his readers would have found interesting. The fact that Lucy's bones were found eroding from the sand, which also contained the remains of crocodile eggs and of turtle eggs and crab claws. It was not because he wanted to conceal the fact, it was because he had been conditioned not to register it as a fact of any significance. In another connection, he clearly, clearly describes his state of mind. Quote, there is no such thing as a total lack of bias. I have it, everybody has it. The fossil hunter in the field has it. If he's interested in hippo teeth, that is what he's going to find. And that will bias his collection because he will risk, he will walk right up to other fossils without noticing them. That's the end of the quote. In his paper to Nature, he went into more minute detail. But even there, crocodiles, turtles, and crabs were only referred to obliquely as a touchstone for how, he, how perfectly the contents of the stratum had been preserved. There he was addressing his peers and did not feel the need to specify these items. They would assume from their own experience that such things might be present and share his conviction that they should be disregarded. Later, there were speculations about whether Australopithecus afarensis fed on leaves or fruits or seeds. No one mentioned the possibility that Lucy's last supper might have consisted of turtle eggs and a couple of small crabs. So the book goes on to talk about how, uh, how that's taphonomic bias, how we're treating this skeleton that was found near water as if it was a land animal. And it's like, well, it could be. It could be a land animal that went to the water to eat. But it could also be like a hippo. It could also be like a crocodile. When we find skeletons of hippos and crocodiles by the water, we know that that's where we expect, that's their habitat. So in this taphonomic bias, we're conditioned to assume that this wasn't her habitat. And, the, and they go on to present the case that actually this was, that, that Lucy was an aquatic ape. She was one of the first aquatic apes. And uh, this was how um, the human species got started. And whether that scenario is right or wrong for Lucy, uh, you know, it doesn't hinge upon Lucy. Lucy is one piece of evidence in, you know, 20 excellent pieces of evidence and if you took Lucy out of the scenario if it was conclusively proven somehow which would be probably impossible that she was a terrestrial creature and not a semi-aquatic one you don't need that to make this case for the aquatic ape but anyways that's it also explains why uh, humans um, stink so bad uh, you go one day without bathing and uh, you already are, you all your bodily oils, like your body exudes all these oils because it's conditioned to be washed every day. So when somebody says it's natural to say, oh, I'm not going to bathe, well, mm, uh, actually, <laughs> nope, wrong. You know, we're not like other mammals. We're not, we're not, we produce so much oil for to, to uh, because we're used to being washed all the time. Anyways, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time on Libro Man.